All right, we're about to embark upon James chapter 2, which you already have when you think about it. We started with the introduction to the book of James, which is all of chapter 1. And then it flows right into chapter 2. If you don't do that, there's some really critical passages, like faith without works is dead. Can a man be saved if he has no works? The answer is implied no. What does that mean? We already looked at James chapter 1, which is about the context of believers who have been saved by the implanted word. You already believed. There are believers already. You will have eternal life. Now get busy with your Christian life. Now why would James chapter 2 say, well, you don't really have it yet until you start doing some works? Because at the end of chapter 1, he started saying now the important thing is to have a godly religion and not one that isn't godly. What is that? Second, you already have a godly religion. Talking about religion, the, the works, the value of the Christian life in this mortal life. We're not talking about whether or not you get to be a Christian. You already are. So we look at James chapter 2. Guess what we look at first? We looked at James chapter 1. I say James chapters 1 and 2 because 2, it cannot be looked at unless you've looked at 1. Almost inevitably, you're going to make a mistake on those two key, two, two key passages I just mentioned. So we went all the way down through all of this, and we looked for the introduction, which is all of chapter 1. The, oops, the introduction, which is all of chapter 1, announced the central theme of James's letter, whereupon it starts with my brothers in James chapter 2. We're not talking about salvation. They already have salvation. They're brothers in Christ. As believers in our glorious Jesus, Lord Jesus Christ. This is what James wrote. I didn't editorialize that. Look what it says. My brothers, as believers in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, don't show favoritism. Are we talking about salvation here? They're already brothers in Christ. It says so. Yet how many people walk in there and say, well, you don't have works, you're not, you're not a brother in Christ. Well, it says we already are. But uh, being already brothers in Christ, if we act a certain way, we're not acting properly. Your faith, without those proper works, is dead, inactive, ineffective, and liable for discipline. So notice that verse 2-1 begins with my brothers as believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ which announces the beginning of the body of the letter. Chapter 1 is an introduction, but it gives you so much you need to look at it first. It focuses on specifics within the congregation of believers, which chapter 1 has already covered. The congregation in James's time, Jewish believers predominantly, that have been scattered throughout uh, the region and elsewhere because of their faith. Chapter 1 has provided the central themes which are then dealt with for the rest of James's letter. on there come back, back Hart John Hart wrote it is now common to view an epistolatory introduction as an author authorial device that announces the central themes of a letter that's a lot of times that's a common practice especially in the Old Testament times like the growth of a flower, the prologue of an epistle is the thematic bud, and the body of the epistle is the full blossom. Read it in the order it was written, starting at the beginning. Furthermore, the conclusion and the introduction will often be joined with verbal and conceptual links that form a harmony of ideas confirming the themes. And these two hermeneutical principles form a check and balance system for interpretation. So if you're off on a tangent from this balance, you're probably misinterpreting. If I, found, if I find in the body of an epistle several basic themes that are not found in the prologue or the epilogue, my exegesis may likely be faulty. That's what John Hart says. Traditional approaches to James chapter 2 flounder against these hermeneutical tests. This issue, the issue is true faith plus verse false faith, does not appear in the introduction or the conclusion of the letter. So that's not going to be the, 
the topic, nor does the introduction concern itself with the conception that true faith results in consistent good works. It hasn't been a topic either. The opening of the epistle reveals that the saints to whom James writes are undergoing trials that are testing their faith. While some are convinced that the, this test is designed to separate genuine faith from spurious faith, such thinking is simply not readily evident. Don't read into it, read from it. So in light of previous discussion in chapter 1 of bringing about the righteous life that God desires and their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, believers are exhorted not to show favoritism. That's the first subject, James chapter 2, that it addresses, which has already been addressed in chapter 1. So it says, my brothers, as believers in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of God, don't show favoritism. Wow, that's the beginning of the topic that continues from chapter 1. The context continues to have believers in view relative to their bringing about the righteous life that God desires through looking intently at the perfect law, the commands in the New Testament epistles that gives freedom, studying the Bible and continuing to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it. This exhorts a believer in the light of doing what the Bible says to keep a, re a tight rein on his tongue. Verse 27 adds, look after widows and orphans in their distress and keep oneself from being polluted by the world. James then continues in this vein with don't show favoritism, prefacing it with the key motivation to do this. My brothers as believers in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. That's who he is to you. You're a believer in him. Don't show favoritism. In light of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory of heaven, the abode and presence of God in whom they believe, the brothers are exhorted to do those things that the perfect law that gives freedom, the commands in the New Testament epistles in the Greek Bible, the New Testament, says to do, the perfect law that gives freedom says to do in order to bring about the righteous life that God desires. James mentions the specific exhortation of not showing favoritism as a special emphasis upon which he elaborates further in the next few verses. So, Zane Hodges, in his excellent epistle on the book of James, writes, actually in this verse, in verse, chapter 2, verse 1, the italicized words in the New King James Version, the Lord, are not present in the original, <coughs> which simply has, of the glory. It is possible that this latter phrase is used like an adjective in the sense of our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. But the presence of the definite article does not easily fit this view. Sometimes you look at nitpicking things in the grammar, like a definite article there, and say, well, what is he talking about? You think about it a little bit more. New King James Version has it pretty right. Uh, right. More, more likely, the phrase in Greek equals the glory, that is, heaven or the presence of God. The whole expression will then mean of our Lord Jesus Christ, of from glory. James would be thinking in that case of the fact that the true abode of the Lord was and is the glorious abode of God himself. Since such a splendid origin for Christ makes any kind of earthly wealth and glory appear drab and worthless by comparison. That's why it starts out with doing that. So therefore don't show favoritism because that's who you are in Christ, the Lord of glory. Faith in one who belongs to glory makes all deference to rich people on earth look shabby and cheap. The readers should not combine their faith with such demeaning behavior by favorizing, uh, favoring the witch. So James exhorts believers to not show favoritism, applying that true believers can evidence not doing good works and still be viewed as believers. Say this is not a salvation passage or a book. James exhorts those whom he stipulates as believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ to not show favoritism, implying that believers can show favoritism, in other words, evidence sinful behavior as opposed to doing good works, yet still be true believers as he stipulated. Nowhere in this section or elsewhere in his letter does James question the authenticity of his audience being anything but true believers destined to be fruit, first fruits in the eternal kingdom to come, works or not because that's what he stipulated in chapter 1. I often say, did you read chapter 1 before you're telling me about chapter 2? The answer is usually no. The very heart, heart goes on, John Hart, the very heart and method of James' appeal in chapter 2 is to arouse, arax, 
acts of mercy from those who know that they have already received the mercy from those who know they have already received the mercy of God. James simply does not question the fact that his readers are true Christians. He appeals to them based on the reality of their new birth. 118. Perhaps the most transparent statement to this effect is 2.1. My brothers, as believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ, are they not believers? Yes, it says so. Do not show favoritism. All that James has to say is designed to shake us as believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ from the comfort of worldliness and challenge us to meet the practical needs of others, such as the needs of an orphan or a widow. He does so without ever finding it necessary to scrutinize our experience of salvation. Well, let's see. I'm seeing how you behave. Are you sure you're saved? Not there. So, we add a few more verses in chapter 2. My brothers, as believers in our Lord Jesus Christ, we're talking about believers, don't show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes, and a poor man in shabby clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet, have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Okay. So the word rendered meeting refers to a Christian congregation, not a traditional Jewish synagogue. So meeting is a bringing together a gathering as the first fruits, but we're define those who are believers in Jesus Christ. So this is a church meeting. Although the Greek word for assembly meeting is the one used for synagogue, the word had a broader sense of place of assembly or, or even meeting. Meaning in sense seems natural here. In fact, it has been maintained recently that the use of the word synagogue for a place of meeting began to develop primarily in the later first century but that the earlier meaning referred to a group which gathered for a religious purpose. In the circle of churches to which James writes, it is not likely that there were many which met in the local synagogue, since that would imply the conversion of most of the synagogue's members, because they would just wouldn't allow that kind of meeting if there were any believers in Christ, in that there would be a riot. Most probably the Jewish Christian churches of Palestine met in private homes where rooms might be set aside to accommodate these gatherings. Stand there or sit on the floor by my feet refers to the less preferential treatment for the poor man. It's obvious by the, the translation. So Hodges says, the statement, sit here at my footstool, is literally sit here under or below my footstool. There could be a touch of ironic exaggeration in these words. James suggests that the position given the poor visitor is so demeaning as to be underneath the footstool on which the speaker rests on his own feet. However, the scene James had in mind may well have been one in which the Christians were reclining at a table to observe the Lord's Supper. If so, the rich visitor is allowed to sit down on a seat in the room to observe the proceedings. The poor visitor, on the other hand, is simply told simply either to stand against the wall or to sit on the floor under, be behind the pillow or object on which the speaker placed his feet. So, Making the distinction that one man is better than another on the basis of material wealth is discriminatory and judgmental and based on evil thoughts, not good Christian behavior. Paul paints a particular scenario as unacceptable Christian behavior, I say James, wherein a man of material means is favored over a poor man in a meeting as to where they are to sit. Such a distinction that a rich man is better than a poor man because of his material wealth is indicated as discriminatory and judgmental based on evil thoughts as opposed to judging on biblical basis. So Paul there is really James. I, sometimes I find little things in there I need to fix, so I've got to go fix that right after this. James 2, 1 to 5. Now we add verse 5. So have you not discriminated in verse 4 among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers, so brothers in Christ, not brothers in Judas, Judaism, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? Notice it's to inherit ownership of the kingdom, not to get into the kingdom. How many people make that mistake? 
faithfulness gives you ownership 